Welcome to episode four of the Anxiety Club podcast. On today's episode, I'll be chatting with writer and mom, Alex Frost, about an article she recently wrote about mom guilt. Welcome to the Anxiety Club. I'm your host, Tori Levine, a former mental health worker with degrees in psychology and criminal justice. So I know the importance of keeping calm in a difficult situation. But when I had my kids, I found myself full of anxiety, constantly questioning if I was doing things right or how I was messing up my kids now. One day, everything clicked and I made a commitment to own my anxiety so it doesn't own me. And that's why I started the Anxiety Club podcast. Each week, we'll discuss all things motherhood. So join me and let's get rid of this anxiety together. Hi, my name is Tori Levine and welcome to the Anxiety Club podcast. First, I want to thank you for listening and supporting the podcast, especially since we just launched last week. This is a big passion project for me and each and every mom that this podcast reaches and is able to help really makes my heart happy. I want to give a special shout out to those of you who have left ratings and reviews. There are some five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts, so thank you. And a few reviews, I just want to give a shout out to the reviewers and listeners. Um, One review posted by uh, someone I'm not sure of the name says, informative and helpful. After listening to this, I know I'm not alone. It was very helpful. And another reviewer, Mad Cohen, titled her review, Awesome. Great podcast for new moms. So thank you. And without any further ado, here is my chat with Alex Frost. Today, I am very thankful to be joined by Alex Frost, a parenting writer, freelance writer, and freelance writer coach, and she is also a mom of three boys under five, and she is the author of an article on Healthline Parenthood, Why Mom or Dad Guilt is a Thing, and What You Can Do to Stop Beating Yourself Up, and I'm very excited to have her here to chat about her research and what she wrote in this article and just life as a mom. Welcome, Alex. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. So I just want to dive right in. I think what first really hooked me is that everything you wrote was 100% so relatable, especially since with everything going on right now with COVID. I love, I took little notes and I said, I love how you discuss that we're in survival mode and egos are rather than vegetables, which I thought was hysterical because in my family, it is pizza and Wacky Mac. Those are like our (laughs) go-to. What is Wacky Mac? I need this. (laughs) Wacky Mac. So we have a, we keep a kosher kitchen. So it is just the kosher version of macaroni and cheese in a box. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) But with shapes and figures. So Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And then I also loved how you talked about the feelings of an inadequacy that can come from the recommendations and just trying to do everything that moms are told now. So mm-hmm. do you, can you just jump right in and tell me if you have number one experienced mom kill yourself and what kind of led you to writing this article? Yeah, sure. I, um, I have experienced mom guilt. I think everybody has at some point whether they acknowledge it as mom guilt or not, and depending on what they do with it. But at first, uh, when I first had my son, my first son about six years ago, five years ago, he, I, I felt like I was not going to be a mom that experienced mom guilt. I was very sure of myself from the beginning for some reason. I was not too worried about advice. It was very clear to me right away that people parent in different ways. Um, but what happened is as I started to have more kids, I think the compounded stress, I now have three sons under five, I did start to feel mom guilt in different ways. Everything from, am I giving everyone equal attention to, you know, what we talked about with diet. I've had a lot of mom guilt around diet because my kids are very picky and I haven't really cracked the code on how to get kids to eat healthy. Like it doesn't seem like hardly anyone else has. Um, So so there would be some outside pressure from family members, you know, kind of like, 
wow, you're letting that kid have a third ice cream cone. I'm like, Hey, that is dairy in my mind. Like this is the closest thing I'm getting right now to succeeding. And also I kind of was able to take a step back and look at a more holistic picture. So for example, since we've been talking diet, you know, what has my child been eating all week as a whole, as opposed to, did he have just one bad meal? Kind of how adults, you know, sometimes look at diet. So, you know, an adult is fine having one cheat meal. Um, but when it's a kid, we start to worry, like, are they having too much sugar? Is it affecting their behavior? You know, all these different things. So I think that um, I started to experience mom guilt the, the farther into parenting I got because I was really trying to figure out what kind of parent do I want to be? You know, what are all these other parents doing? And do I like or not like the way that they're parenting? And I did notice that I took more of a free range parenting style than some other people did. Um, I know some of those parenting styles are buzzwords right now, but I did notice I associated more with that. So, you know, I would let my kids do a little bit more. I wasn't really um, that concerned about them getting hurt or, you know, to an extent I was obviously, but I wasn't like, oh my gosh, be careful. And so I noticed quickly that my laid back approach was overly laid back for some people. Um, And so then I started to experience mom guilt, like, do I, am I doing enough? Am I being too chill? So all those things have gone on from food to behavior. And I think it's something that we all have to deal with, you know, as we go through watching other people parent and figuring out our own styles, which is why I wrote the article. I would have to agree with you with once you had a second child, that is definitely, there was a big game changer in everything because that just compounds all of yeah. what you're trying to do right for one child now and two. <laughs> so, right. So I think a lot I remember of- sending my older kid once to get a diaper for the younger one when I had forgotten to like refill the diapers at the diaper table. And I felt so bad for a couple of days. I was like, oh gosh, I don't want this kid to turn into like the little parenting helper. I don't want to put that on them. On the other hand, I'm like, we're a team. This is a family. We all pitch in, you know, so I've balanced those kinds of thoughts too. Right. And you're just clicking right with what I, (laughs) same experiences here of like, oh my gosh, I said that. And now he's going to think he's constantly in charge of the younger one. And (laughs) yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of it is just us not applying the moderation rule to our own parenting and not having grace with ourselves on that. So it's a lot different to snap at your kid and yell at them once versus, you know, someone who is yelling at their kid all day, every day. And I think we think that kids are going to be so affected by these one little thing we do. And so we become guilty about it when really, like I said, about looking at the bigger picture, like how many times has this happened this week, this month, this year, you know, is it really going to affect them long-term? And it's crazy to think that like my almost two-year-old probably like doesn't even remember anything about his life so far. So everything I've been guilty about, like, he hasn't even caught on yet. <laughs> right. I love that bigger picture idea. And that's perfect for, as you were saying, everything at looking at diet at looking at how much screen time at looking at how much play time. And I think the pandemic has really exacerbated that because it's just like, we've had time to sit here all together and go, okay, what are we really doing with our kids? So it's definitely been on people's minds. Definitely adds so much more stress and like you were saying, it's a lot different to snap at your kid one time versus screaming at them all day. Whereas Mm -hmm. that is one of my key triggers is saying, okay, I feel like I just snapped. And then I go down that spiral and it's just so easy to keep going and going and going. One of the ways I get out of it is just like flipping a switch and doing a dance because that helps (laughs) change everything. That's cute. I like that. Yeah. Silliness definitely helps. Is there something that you notice is like a real key trigger for you? Is it the yeah food? Is it the screen? Is it the... I think you're onto something that it's definitely things that um, either we've personally experienced, you know, that kind of, like you said, trigger us. Um, so, you know, I'm trying to clean up my diet after having multiple kids, gaining some baby weight. So yeah, for me, diet, when someone says, oh, your kids eat a lot of sugar, that is triggering for me because I'm kind of like, oh my gosh, like I'm spending all this time thinking about my diet. Am I thinking enough about their diet? Am I being too lax with, you know, what I'm allowing them to have and how does it affect their behavior? So for me, I think things like that, that I've experienced are, um, I guess, triggers for guilt. The yelling you did that we talked about. Yeah. I mean, I think that, I mean, I think we've all had parents that have yelled at us at some point. I, mine were not in an unhealthy way, but I do think I want my kids to grow up in an environment that, 
you know, they don't have this someone, I don't know who it is, but they call it the blur of childhood. They don't want rem to remember their blur that is their childhood as this stressed out place where there was yelling and nagging and um, just anxiety ridden conversations. So I think that's something when I heard that word blur, it really helped me understand. It's not one incident. It's how does their blur feel overall? Now I really wish I could think of it was an author or speaker or someone who said that. And so I think that that helped me. I think it was Ali Kazaza. Do you follow her? I don't, but now I'll have you to should, you will love her. She's, she's like a minimalist um, podcast influencer person, but she talks a lot about parenting and runs a business. So anyway, I, I'm pretty sure she's the one that talked about it. And I love that idea because it takes the pressure off for if there's one incident or a couple incidents, it's not necessarily something that becomes a part of the feeling of the kids blur, which is their childhood. So that is a great way to explain that with the blur. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things that I spoke with someone about is you want to, how do you want your kids to remember? Like, what is the one thing? Yeah. Is it a happy child. Is it, a, is it a unconditional love? It goes with that blur. So my goal is the more positive rather than negative. That makes sense. In your article, I love how you said if your own trigger is social media or your own screen time. And I know that oh, yeah. is a huge trigger for me. Mm -hmm. And either because it's disengaging me from my kids right, or right. you are seeing these picture perfect moments. Yeah, um, I understand. Yeah. And I think that's important. I think I talk about in there, um, identifying what is your trusted circle, who is in your trusted circle, the people you would rely on for advice. And, um, I think I called it like spring cleaning or cleaning up your, um, that circle. So if you're allowing, let's say it's six people, some family members, some friends, whoever to, to be allowed to give input that matters to you, um, not to say that you can stop people from giving input, but kind of input that you're allowing to breach that inner, um, you know, whatever, your heart, your head, your soul, whatever that you are allowing to become a concern. I think spring cleaning that can really help and just, you know, I'm setting up some boundaries. So if someone is starting to give you advice about one of these trigger areas that you don't need to hear or you don't consider someone from your trusted circle, kind of just, you know, making a point of politely saying, we're doing okay in that area, you know, thanks for your advice, or, you know, or whatever, however you politely brush them off. But I think that can be one of the ways to do that. But especially um, also cleaning up your social media influence, who you're following, what the positivity is of the, the people you're following. I did a um, spring clean after my third baby, because like I said, I was worried about um, body and eating and exercise. And I just went through my Instagram and, and replaced people who I felt like were not representing real bodies or not promoting real bodies um, in healthy bodies. And I kind of just changed what I was inputting and what their focus was. So taking off influencers whose whole goal was to promote their skinny body all over, you know, their Instagram and, and replaced it with people both skinny and not skinny who were more body positive and promoting healthiness and physical fitness over um, some of those other ideals. So that's an example of something that you can do when it comes to just cleaning up your own influence. Cause we're not immune to, you know, when we're letting all these things in, we're not immune to them. And they do bring us down over time. As a journalist, I was realizing I was reading tons of stories involving tragedies with kids. And I had to really clean up how much of that I was allowing to be inputted into my life, even though it was for my job. You know, I mean, I think it was last summer, there was something like five drownings in like a month. Um, in our area. And I, after a while, I'm like, okay, I can't allow all these into my brain, right. but you know, I digress. So I think um, another thing you can do is listening to your child in particular, as opposed to comparing to other people's children or parenting, you know, is my child um, acting like they need something from me that I'm not providing? And that could be my only way that I would change something that I do feel guilty about. So like you said, mentioning screen time, if I do feel like my child is changing how they act, behave, think, if it's really influencing my child because they're on the, the TV or iPad too much, you know, is that something that I personally want to consider changing as opposed to doing it because I'm comparing to their friend, Joe, you know, a play group who only gets 20 minutes every other Friday like, you know, that's, so I think that's a better comparison than to other people, but hard to do. Yeah. It is really hard when yeah. everything is 
picture perfect or you're going out with play groups and you're comparing yourself. I, yeah. I feel like the whole comparing of one child to the next as well, even within your own family unit can yeah. make you a it's little hard. Laugh. Yeah. <laughs> and I also think it's okay to listen to what the mom guilt is saying and consider, is this mom guilt just trying to tell me something that I do really believe? So you know, in the pandemic, maybe a month in, I also had the screen time dilemma. I was like, wow, I, yes, I'm trying to work from home and it's really hard and there's no childcare and my kids are watching TV while I'm on calls and there's not a whole lot I can do. Is there? And then, you know, so paying attention to it and thinking, you know, why is this mom guilt here? Is it something that I, I do want to do something about or not? Um, and I just read another article for Healthline about parental anxiety that's coming out soon. And it was one of the the tips is about go ahead and take concrete action if there's something giving you anxiety. It's not like you have to just say, oh, that's mom guilt. I need to get it out of my head. So the example I use in that next article is if the neighbor's pool is giving you anxiety and you think your kid's going to drown in it all the time, go ahead and take some steps to make sure that doesn't happen or at least to minimize the fear around that. Um, you know, go ahead and ask for a lock on the gate or whatever it is you need to do, teach the kid how to swim. Um, so I think that that those concrete steps can be helpful if you do have pressing mom guilt. That's something that keeps coming up about a topic that, you know, really bothers you. So like I said, with the diet, you know, yeah, I'm giving my kids egos a lot. I've started adding, you know, a fruit in one of those little like kid protein shakes with it. And I feel better. It's like, okay, I feel like they're getting more of a balanced meal. They're not fighting with me over the ego everybody's happy. So I think that that kind of thing can help. Yes. I, I like you talked about trusting your gut and that mom instinct, because there is a real reason that you would have mom guilt. Um, but then addressing, is it taking, is it overwhelming and taking over like your whole thought process? Because right. then that is something where you would maybe want to seek therapy Correct. or something like that, which I am a supporter yeah. of. And, and I think us encouraging other moms to reconsider where the mom guilt is coming from. I think I think that we are able to change the mom guilt culture by how we talk to our mom friends and to be leaders in our playgroups and social circles about that, you know, and questioning, you know, why is it that you're telling everyone um, how much screen time you want your kid to reduce to? Or, you know, is that really what's best for your kid? Or are you feeling pressure? And kind of being there for other moms that do seem to be showing signs of mom guilt um, so that we can influence the whole community to not feel this way and to feel more supported. Uh, yes, I love that. It's And moms really do need to support each other, which is a very challenging thing right now because there are, is that inability to really get together in the right. support groups, which is right. my really hope and goal for this is to mm -hmm. really help other new moms, but that support group. And then I, the other thing I wanted to chat about was, do you have specific things that you do that can kind of flip you out of that downward spiral if you get there. I have a list of a bunch, but if you have an example, you can go ahead first. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that um, once I've eliminated that it is something I want to change, so that's kind of my first question to myself is, is this something that's actually a problem or I'm just kind of comparing to other people? So once I decide if it's like, I call it like fake or real mom guilt, you know, is it real mom guilt in that I I feel bad because I'm, you know, sucking at that area of parenting and need to pick it up a little bit? Or is it fake mom guilt? Like it's not worth my time. It's just kind of a dumb anxiety that I got from some place that's not valid. So I think the first step is identifying which of those it is. Um, after that, I mean, if it is real mom guilt, I do things like make lists and make plans and, you know, be overly organized about what to do next. But um, if it's fake mom guilt, I try to identify the source. And if the source, like I said, is coming from a person or an influence that I don't feel is positive and that's happened more than once, then I consider getting some space from that source. So let's say there's a, a friend who's overbearing or, you know, some influence in my life that, um, you know, lends to too much mom guilt. I try to look at, literally look at my calendar and be like, how can I minimize time either with that person or feeling pressure from that person and or source, whatever it is, and then kind of try to replace with more positive um, influences. So, and sometimes that can even mean filling that void of advice with someone else. So it, when we talk about diet, I mean, I can go to the pediatrician and actually have a meeting and say, look, here's what my kid's eating. How bad is this? Should I be worried? You know, what, how far am I from? What little changes can I make? And then I, once I have that expert source, I tend to enjoy like, 
research, expert sources, things like that, just from the yeah. journalism background. So once I have something like that to hang on to, I feel like I use that as my like, you know, North Star, like beacon, whatever. And then I compare other opinions I hear to that. So, okay, the pediatrician has said X, Y, Z, or this expert source has said X, Y, Z. Now I'm going to compare all the shenanigans I hear from everyone else to that and decide if it works for my family. So for me, the expert source thing does help like to get the quote truth from someone who knows. That, that is wonderful. I, <laughs> my husband says I could research things to death because I'm in the yeah. same way as I, I want, yeah. I want studies. I want this. Right. I want that. Which um, ironically in that upcoming article, I talked about having how, when we're in that world so much, it's like, it almost backfires. Cause we do know that studies often conflict with each other. Right. So we have one, co- <laughs> one study saying screen time isn't really that big of a deal. And one saying your kid's going to be a serial killer. If they watch another <laughs> Netflix show, like, which is it? And we all know the studies conflict sometimes. So I think people who are in this space and spend a lot of time studying and thinking about these things, you know, are at an advantage with knowledge, but a disadvantage and that you kind of get away from focusing on your own gut and you are always looking to these other sources. So that's the downside. That That is a really great tip too. Yeah. It's just like, let's, yeah. again, like you're saying that whole blur, let's put it all into perspective, yeah. everything together. So, right. Yeah. Um, these are my little, like I had just mentioned okay. earlier, the, the dancing, my little fun things to get out of. And this is more that immediate, not like the bigger yeah. like long-term mom guilt is moving because my history is with, I have a psychology degree and my, one of my favorite classes was neuroscience and talking all about the serotonin, endorphins, all the different stuff in your brain. Yeah, and that's awesome movement definitely helps that. You had discussed scheduling one-on-one time with the kids. So if they're, and that's more of a big picture, like saying, Hey, to your significant other, like you take this kid, (laughs) let me have this kid Yeah, because I can tell they're missing this one-on-one time. I'm missing that one-on-one time. We just need that to kind of like regroup and get back to it. And it doesn't have to be a long time or a big date. I've seen some people try to schedule these big dates, especially during COVID. And it's like, no, like take them with you to the post office. Like it, it, 10 minutes to a kid is kind of a long time. Like it's fine. <laughs> that was actually one of the examples that my husband used with with COVID. He was like, well, I guess you really haven't had any one-on-one time with Ruben, our oldest, because I would just take him places. Like we would go to right. Target or we would run, yeah. get food or something. So yeah create a screen-free environment. If that is a trigger for you, if that's not, go for it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Have your screens everywhere. But for me, it's that I can get sucked into that and I can get super focused. And then I feel guilty that I'm neglecting my kids who are happily playing right over there and not even trying. (laughs) Well, and I think um, for me with the screen time, narrowing it down to a specific time of day where it's a concentrated, reliable, like they know So I usually do a lot of phone calls during this time of day. The youngest is napping. I let the older two watch shows. So they know from whatever time it is, like one to two, two to three, whatever, that they'll be allowed to watch shows. It's not, you know, and it's not a super timed thing. Like if I have a couple calls, it's longer that day. The next day it might be 10 minutes, but we call it chill time. And it's kind of replaced napping um, Mm -hmm. for the older two. And it just kind of allows their bodies to not be in the 90 degrees, you know, and just rest for a little bit. So I, I think that that's helped too is before I felt out of control with screen time because I it was like here and there all day and I didn't know, I couldn't actually tell anyone how long they'd been on screens because I really didn't know myself. It was kind of random. So that scheduling aspect I think helps a little bit too. Uh, yeah, I really like that. That is one thing we do too is if I'm getting the baby to bed or to nap and my older son, he'll he'll get the iPad and he'll either get to watch whatever, or he has books on the iPad, which he loves. So yeah, I'm all about that. Fun. <laughs> yeah. And those little swaps are good too. Like, so yeah, it's a screen, but are they watching a phonics game or, you know what I mean? It's like, so not all screen time is equal. I feel like. Uh, yeah, no. And more specifically for screen time, I was talking about my screen time, not theirs. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, gotcha. that is, Sorry. That's <laughs> my trigger because I yeah. feel like I can get zoned and sucked into that yeah. zone. Um, oh, yeah when instead of spending time with them but then that's the whole like quality over quantity um, which is definitely that's hard and then kind of going along with that quality over quantity the self-care time is 
there's this idea now, I feel like that self-care, mom, you have to go to the spa. You have to go get a massage and do all these other things. That is your self-care. And if you're not doing that, then you're again, failing. I feel like there's like that failure again. (laughs) And that just adds to this mom guilt because you're not even taking care of yourself. But one of the ways to battle that overwhelm and that guilt feeling of doing something for yourself is just taking that first little step. Like that is my, if that, if I can't get anything else, if I can't get a five minutes alone locked in the bathroom that day, right, right. I will say no. Um, and yeah. say, and just saying no can be empowering and then help right. you take that next step for your self-care. So is there yeah, anything- in addition to the saying no, I just, I just read another article about um, channeling your, your own love language when it comes to self-care, because we are all kind of sick of the whole bubble bath, wine podcast, uh, no offense to podcast, but bubble gas, wine podcast idea, like, oh, you're in this bubble bath. This is what's going to rejuvenate you as a mom. Um, I, I mean, I've taken some good bubble baths, but that's not really what I feel like doing all the time. So it's like, what, well, how can you apply your own love language? If you haven't looked up, like, you know, people haven't looked up the five love languages they can identify through like a quick test, which one's theirs. And, um, for example, one of them is gifts, which moms have a hard time with because they are used to this society of moms are selfless. You know, moms can't ever have things that they want. We buy all the kids school clothes before we ever buy new clothes, things like that. So um, gifts is one of my love languages. And I thought, you know, how can I integrate my love language into self-care? I, and so one of the ways I did that was by buying a subscription box, you know, one of those little like, I don't know, I think it has like some random dumb stuff like makeup and jewelry and whatever in it. Um, but it really wasn't about what's in the box. It was about the idea that on a monthly basis, this thing's going to come. I'm going to feel nice. I'm going to feel like, you know, um, appreciated by just the whole setup of my family. So I think rethinking about what your love language is and how that contributes to what self-care you will pick is important. And um, for some people, it's quality time um, where you either need quality time with yourself alone or for other people, you need quality time with others, you know. So I think um, just knowing that about yourself can help us narrow down this, this self-care, you know, overused word that we're all not quite sure what to do with. Yes. The, the love languages, the five love languages are great for yourself, for your significant other, for your kids. They are, that's a great, good book to go look at. Mm-hmm. So since we just talked about love languages and self-care, one of the questions that I ask in the Momsiety Club membership, as well as it's a question I've asked for years in the talk portion of Mommy Wear classes is, what is something that you have done for yourself in the past week? I've been uh, dedicating a lot of time to leaving my house to go to a, um, like a boot camp type gym. And that's kind of doubled as my self-care lately because it's one of the only places that I can go during COVID. (laughs) But um, yeah, so I think making time to leave the house and go there because that's the best type of workout for me has been an experience. Sometimes it's hard to do. I used to not leave to go to the gym because I had young kids, because it was dinner time, because it was bedtime. And it wasn't a really great reason. Like my husband was home. He's willing and able to help. Um, you know, he does half the stuff. So it's like, why was I feeling like I was missing out by leaving or that I wasn't, you know, parenting back to the mom guilt thing. So I think that that, that is really helpful to be like, okay, you know, three to four times a week, I'm leaving for an hour. I don't even really need to plan it that far ahead of time. I can just do it when it feels like it's a good time. And, you know, I try to do it like every other day. So I think that's been a good tip for me is not, like working out at home just hasn't worked for me very well. I'm not as motivated alone as I am in a group atmosphere. So kind of just prioritizing that as something that's okay for me to do and good for me to do um, has been helpful. Is there anything else that you would like to share with the moms out there? Um, I will link to the articles that we talked about and your website and social media in the show notes, but feel free Mm -hmm. to share them here as well. Yeah, I think to all the moms, I would just say, um, if no one's told you recently that you are doing a really amazing job parenting, um, and that, you know, all the feelings that you have of inadequacy are really, um, probably not from the truth, but from all these outside triggers and outside influences. So I just would encourage all the moms to spend time with positive, supportive people that build you up instead of making you feel more mom guilty. 
So that's what I would say to the moms. And um, regarding, yeah, my career and my website, if anyone wants to connect with me, I'm happy to talk to moms or to, you know, other writers or anybody in this parenting space. Uh, my website is alexandra-frost.com. And there's a place to contact me there or follow me on social media. So those are all good ways to follow me and uh, kind of engage. And I have all my work posted there as well. So if you want to read other parenting stuff, that's most of my day. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much. It was a joy talking to you and you, you are a wonderful wealth of knowledge for all of this as, as is, I think, uh, any mom who has felt it. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It's awesome. I appreciate what you're doing for all the, the moms out there. Thank you. Well, at the end of each episode, I ask a question for listeners to call in or email in. And at the end of last week, we asked about mom guilt, since that was our topic today. And we have a caller, Lisa, all the way from Australia. Hi, I'm Lisa Johnson DeFranco from Brisbane, Australia. I experienced mom guilt whenever I wanted to take time out to do something for myself. I found it so hard to balance being a mum and being an individual with dreams and aspirations. It got so bad that I entered into a soulful depression. Being the mum who sacrificed herself for everyone else led me to be, frankly, a terrible mum. I was so unhappy and that affected my family. All I had wanted was to be a good mum and I ended up being the opposite. So what if I tried the opposite? What if I made time for me? What if this mum guilt was the problem? I started to dive into being more me, rediscovering myself and what was really important to me. I made time for the things that lit me up and my life and the way I experienced it started to change and so did my mothering. I am so passionate about this and I have created a Conscious Mother Circle on Facebook now to help mothers make time for themselves because this mum guilt is so backwards. When you have made time to fill up your cup, you are able to be the mum you want to be. Thank you, Lisa. What she mentioned reminds me of my guest in episode two, Meredith Siget, who began a journey to find herself as well after having two children. I also love that Lisa was so passionate that she started a conscious mother's circle in her area. Lisa, I definitely can relate to a lot of those same feelings you had. So thank you for sharing. So, Mama, would you like to share about a time that you have felt mom guilt? The question this week, and what I think I'm going to be asking as a reoccurring question, is what have you done for yourself this week? Leave a voicemail by calling 717-461-2283, or you can email a voicemail to hello at momxietyclub.com. You might just hear your story featured on a future episode. And while you're at it, let's take one thing off your never-ending future to-do list as a mom. To get the most out of the Momxiety Club podcast, hit subscribe so each new episode is sent directly to your phone. Would you like to help other new moms just like yourself? A very easy way to do that is to share the Momxiety Club podcast with a friend or go to your favorite podcast app and rate and review the podcast. These reviews help get the Bombsiety Club podcast in front of more moms just like you. Are you searching for a community, a place to find both emotional and physical support for the stress, anxiety, and overwhelm that comes along with motherhood? This is also a place where you can share the fun and joy of those little ones as well. But that's what we do in the Bombsiety Club membership, and it's less than $10 a month. Head to the momxietyclub.com. That's M O M X I E T Y C L U B.com for information on joining our email list as well as becoming a member of the Momxiety Club. Thanks for listening. Now let's go get rid of this momxiety together. The Momxiety Club podcast is not intended to take the place of medical advice or therapy. If you are in crisis, call your local emergency number or the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-237-TALK.